Hi, I'm Mike Pisa from Catholic Charities in Portland, New York. Uh, before I start, I want to get a sense as to who everyone is in the room. How many people worked in licensed housing? Could you I see a raise, a show of hands? How about, uh, how many people have worked in housing over 10 years? Okay. okay. <laughs> and uh, with the licensed housing, how about OMH housing? Oasis housing? Okay, that's a good idea. For everyone that's in the, probably in the housing business over 10 years, you probably saw the pendulum swing. But anyway, uh, we got into uh, sort of a harm reduction probably in the early 90s when um, the state was developing MICA programs. At the time, that was the challenging population for the decade. And those of you who've been providing housing since uh, the early 90s probably uh, could understand and embrace what I'm talking about. And I know I was at a conference once and I heard somebody present a definition of a MICA client as somebody who probably will break all your rules in 24 hours. So that was the uh, challenging population that we we're dealing with. And some of the, uh, some of those ideas um, and those individuals who broke all the rules, it was probably because we had a structure that probably didn't really embrace where they were at at that point in their life. So it wasn't like there were individuals that weren't going to be successful. It was just that the current wisdom of the time in terms of the structure of our programs, our state regulations, um, it had us putting individuals uh, sort of a square peg in a round hole and it didn't work. So what we did was we recognized the, uh, the need for something other than our traditional services at the time. So we started to look at uh, harm reduction and other forms of housing. Um, that evolved into probably the year 2000 when we uh, were able to purchase an, uh, an old adult home and uh, we looked at the challenging individuals that we got coming through the system and the referrals in our programs that some individuals had 23 rehabs. They had uh, lived in probably some of the best housing programs in New York State with the same outcomes. And we're looking at that uh, and scratching our heads saying, you know, if we send this individual to another rehab, what are we going to accomplish? Because he's probably going to come out or she's going to come out facing the same uh, challenges um, and with the same behavior. So what we did was we uh, involved everyone that was going to be moving into that uh, that adult home and a new housing model that we had. It was sort of an off-the-grid SRO. And uh, in doing so, everyone that moved in there had some sweat equity, so they had some, some ownership. But the individuals that moved in were individuals that had a long history of uh, poor outcomes in um, traditional licensed programs and even unlicensed programs in their own apartments. So what we did was we remodeled it, gave it to them to live in, and uh, they had a sense of ownership. We tried to lay out some ground rules uh, to respect individuals' um, individual rights that are living there, and if you're going to use, try to do it behind closed doors. So for the community, especially the clinicians working with the clients at the time, it was really difficult to embrace. Uh, also, our staff um, had a difficult time with it too, because you know, it, early in the transition, they saw individuals that, you might turn that down, individuals that um, would, uh, would be in our licensed programs um, that were experiencing some difficulties and then all of a sudden we would put them in housing in a harm reduction model and they said, geez, you're rewarding them for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, no, we're not really rewarding them for bad behavior. We're meeting them with where they're at at the time. So it took a lot of education and training of the staff to be able to have them look at the outcomes and look at uh, the reality of the situation to embrace it. But going back to our SRO, the individuals that moved in there, um, after, some individuals were there over a decade, and it was the longest period of stability uh, for individuals in their adult life. Uh, even the families, uh, were they sober all the time? No, they weren't. 
but what we were able to do was to establish a very honest working relationship with them. So when we'd walk in and see John, we could say, John, uh, have you drank more than a 12-pack today? And you'd get an honest response. When they were placed in, in uh, traditional programs, it was very hard to get an honest response. So uh, it's, it established a working relationship where they knew we were there to help. We weren't there to discharge them. We were there to try to engage them uh, when they are ready for that engagement. We try to keep them involved in clinics when possible. It was a challenge because we were, uh, the idea was new on the block in Cortland County. And uh, to get clinicians to try to buy into it, probation, um, you know, now drug courts have to buy into it. And it requires a lot of community education. And what we also discovered was uh, they had self-imposed sobriety. Uh, and it was really interesting because when we looked at periods of sobriety that they had in this, uh, in this housing first model without a lot of supervision, without a lot of requirements, it matched to probably the lengths of sobriety that they were able to achieve in, in uh, licensed programs and traditional programs. So the outcomes weren't that much different than the traditional programs they were in, but certainly um, it also had a sense of community where individuals, if somebody was using to the extent where it looked like it was, they're going down a harmful path, their, uh, their fellow roommates or uh, tenants that were in the building, you know, really tried to get them to look at where they're at with their use. And usually they were probably more effective than the clinicians were at the time in terms of encouraging them to get some help. So, you know, we've come a long way and we're trying to develop other models. You know, we do a lot of turnkey apartments. In upstate New York, it's really easy to do turnkey apartments. So most of our apartments, other than one or two uh, uh, cluster sites, are really turnkey apartments that are single bed, uh, both Oasis licensed, uh, OMH licensed, and some are just uh, generic housing and, um, and unlicensed housing. So we're continuing to develop that model, and I know that uh, our social services recognizes the need and the cost savings that come along with that model, and they're trying to get us to develop some more uh, additional transitional housing for individuals getting out of the local jails and some of the more difficult to place individuals that are in our community. You know, the drawbacks of being in a small community is, uh, when individuals burn their bridges with landlords, it's very difficult to place them in, in uh, housing settings in the future. And so we have to develop our own housing for those individuals. But, um, you know, the road has been bumpy. Uh, the staff now, uh, our, our current staff are, are fully trained. We, we try to keep them current. All the information we get from this conference will probably uh, be disseminated when, when we get back to the office. So not only encouraging the staff, though, but it's encouraging. We try to, uh, to educate this community. You know, I sit on the subcommittee, um, uh, the mental health subcommittee, the chemical dependency subcommittees. So all this housing first information, evidence-based practices and research, I hand out during these committees. Uh, Criminal Justice Advisory Board, we hand it out to the judges. The chief of, of probation, uh, the chief of police are there, the, uh, the sheriff. So all the individuals that are dealing with the population that we work with, when they are struggling, they're more sensitive. We have a, uh, a strong presence with the EDPRT team with our local police department. So they're all educated in uh, trauma-informed care, the Housing First model. Uh, they sit in our, our SPOA and our admission committee uh, meetings, so they get a better understanding of the clients that they might have to knock on their doors, so what they're struggling with on an individual basis. So having the uh, community buy-in certainly makes our uh, services and pushing that Housing First model um, a lot easier for our community. And not everybody has a small community that they could probably have uh, that information uh, disseminated in the community like we can, but to have the police department on board is, is saying a lot because, you know, in terms of barriers and obstacles for the individuals that we traditionally deal with, they were probably some of the biggest ones uh, in 
you know, 20 years ago. Michael, for clarification, you said turnkey. You're talking about site-based or scattered site? Scattered site, turnkey. Uh, the, all of the, uh, even the, um, the congregate SRO that we have, it's permanent housing. So like I said, individuals have been there over a decade. Um, family members are just amazed at, uh, at the stability that they achieved or we achieved with the individuals that live there where they saw them struggling all their lives. And these are individuals that are in their 50s for some of them. Uh, and to have a sense of community while they live there, they just, uh, they're really uh, very impressed with that. So you're finding now that it's yeah. easier for you to develop new programs that are scattered site? Scattered site, but we also uh, see the, f the need for community too, the sense of community. So we sometimes we try to cluster the apartments under one roof. It's harder in uh, rural settings in Cortland because there aren't a lot of buildings that uh, have uh, large uh, single apartments in. Great. Thank so. you, Michael. Rita, why don't you join in? 